This episode of The History Guy brought to you by NordVPN. Take control of your internet experience today. It is July 15th, 2022, and 57 years ago today, in 1965, Mariner 4 was closer than any spacecraft had ever come to our planetary neighbor, Mars. Mariner 4 sent back the first images of another planet ever returned from deep space, even though that required the help of a, a few items from an arts and crafts store. Mariner 4 redefined our understanding of the red planet. It changed our strategy for exploring Mars, but it also set the stage for further missions, not just to Mars, but to Mercury, Venus, and even the outer planets. It is history that deserves to be remembered. You've heard me talk about NordVPN before. I spend a lot of time researching online and I need to surf securely. NordVPN is super easy to use. Turn it on with just one click. Your NordVPN subscription covers multiple devices so that you can protect up to six devices on the same account. And if you have any questions or problems with your NordVPN service, customer service experts are available 24 seven. And with more than 5,400 servers in 59 countries, with NordVPN, you can enjoy the internet with no limits or borders. NordVPN has always been the History Guys VPN, but now it's gotten even better. A VPN hides your IP address and encrypts your data, which protects you from all sorts of nasty things, but a VPN only does so much. And that's why NordVPN is becoming more than a VPN with threat protection. Now your NordVPN will also protect you against malware, malicious websites, trackers, and intrusive ads, and it does that even if you aren't connected to a VPN server. Even if you accidentally download a malicious file, the threat protection will scan it and delete it, because that is history that you don't want to be remembered. So take control of your internet experience today with NordVPN and get a screaming deal, a two-year plan at a huge discount plus an additional month free if you sign up using the link nordvpn.com slash thehistoryguy. It's all risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee, and that deal with an additional free month is the very best deal you can get on NordVPN. You can only get it here through YouTube, so sign up using the link nordvpn.com slash thehistoryguy, or of course sign up using the link in the description. The roots of the Mariner program can be tied specifically to the 1958 launch of Explorer 1, the first artificial Earth satellite launched by the United States. Tracking the satellite required a global communications network, and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which had been under the auspices of the Army since 1943, created a network using portable radio tracking stations in Nigeria, Singapore, and California. In 1958, the JPL was transferred to NASA as the nation sought to consolidate its various space exploration programs under a single civilian entity. One of JPL's primary responsibilities was the design and execution of lunar and planetary exploration programs using remotely controlled spacecraft, and it followed that NASA should create a single communication system that would accommodate deep space missions rather than having each project design its own system. This was initially called the Deep Space Instrumentation Facility, or DSIF, but would later be called the Deep Space Network. The network required three facilities, separated by approximately 120 degrees of longitude. That meant that as the Earth turned, a spacecraft was always above the horizon of at least one station. The network included three stations, one each in California, Spain, and Australia. As the construction of the DSN progressed, JPL started planning for missions to take advantage of the system. Additionally, NASA was about to gain significantly more capability for launching deep space missions with the introduction of the Atlas rocket system, a liquid-fueled rocket system originally developed for intercontinental ballistic missiles that was first introduced in 1957. The combination of the Atlas rocket and the DSN allowed new capabilities, and in 1960, JPL began planning for a series of robotic interplanetary probes to explore the inner solar system. According to an official NASA history, the project was named Mariner based on a naming convention suggested by Edgar M. Courtright, Assistant Director of Lunar and Planetary Programs. Under the Courtright system, the names of planetary mission probes were patterned after nautical terms to convey the impression of travel to great distance and remote lands. Interestingly, the Mariner program overlapped the Pioneer program. The exploration vehicles of the Mariner program would be small, each weighing less than half a ton. Their general design would include solar panels, which would be pointed towards the sun, and a dish antenna that would be pointed towards the Earth, and each would carry a number of scientific instruments. 
representative of the reliability of space exploration and launch vehicles at the time, the Mariner missions were planned in pairs. That is, JPL explained in a fact sheet entitled Mariner to Mercury, Venus and Mars, each of the Mariner projects was designed to have two spacecraft launch on separate rockets in case of difficulties with the nearly untried launch vehicles. Mariners 1 and 2 were intended to make planetary flybys to investigate Venus. The probe's launch was coordinated to take advantage of a window that opens every 19 months in which Venus and the Earth reach relative positions in their orbits around the Sun, such that a minimum of fuel is required to travel from one planet to the other. The imperative to meet this window required rushed planning, and NASA was not able to make the launch window in 1961. This allowed the Soviets to beat NASA to the punch with the Venera 1 probe. While Venera 1 became the first probe to fly by Venus, the probe's communication systems failed and it was unable to transmit any data on the planet. Mariners 1 and 2 were developed from the probes used in the Ranger program, probes designed to photograph the surface of the moon. They were designed for a weight of 447 pounds, or 203 kilograms, and would include two solar panels, or wings. The probes carried several scientific instruments, but no camera, as Venus is surrounded by bright, opaque clouds that hide the planet's surface. Mariner 1 lifted off on July 22, 1962 and almost immediately the rocket veered off course. This offered a potential hazard to populated areas, and according to NASA, because of a launch vehicle deviation from the planned flight path, Mariner 1 was destroyed by the range safety officer after approximately 290 seconds of flight. The failure was tracked to a software error in the guidance system. The $18.5 million probe was lost on a simple error, the omission of a single character in the software. But the loss was instructive, and new procedures as well as more durable computer programs were developed. The decision to have the missions designed in pairs turned out to be wise. The error was corrected, and Mariner 2 launched August 27th, before the launch window closed. Unlike Mariner 1, the launch went flawlessly, and the spacecraft successfully navigated a mid-course correction. On December 14, 1962, Mariner 2 passed within 21,607 miles, or 34,773 kilometers, of Venus. Unlike Venera 1, the craft maintained communication, making the mission the first successful mission to another planet. In addition, Mariner 2 tested various engineering systems, such as attitude control, environmental control, and power systems, setting the stage for the next set of missions to Mars. This was not the first attempt to explore Mars. The Soviets had actually attempted five missions to the Red Planet, but all had failed. The Soviet Mars 1 spacecraft managed to fly by Mars in June of 1963, but by then had already lost communication and was unable to transmit any data. As before, two spacecraft were assigned to the NASA mission, which had the ambitious goal to photograph and return images of another planet. As with the Venus mission, the reason that two spacecraft were assigned was to account for the possibility that one of the craft might fail. The 574-pound, or roughly 260-kilogram craft, carried four solar panels. Mariner 3 launched on November 6, 1964. While the launch seemed to go as planned, within an hour after launch, it was clear that the ship's solar panels had not deployed and the batteries were draining. Telemetry data suggested that a fairing, a launch cover for the instruments, had failed to separate, preventing the solar panels from deploying. Engineers tried to develop a solution to cause the fairing to separate, but ran out of time, and eight hours after launch, the probe's batteries failed. Even had they gotten the fairing to separate, the additional weight had already reduced the probe's velocity to the point where it would not have reached Mars. Once again, the fragile nature of space exploration was demonstrated, and once again it proved prudent to have assigned two spacecraft to the mission. The theory was that the fairing, or payload shrouds, inner fiberglass lining had separated from its skin, which then fouled the spring mechanism that was to have jettisoned the shroud. The solution was to create a single-piece all-metal shroud, but this increased the spacecraft's liftoff weight, requiring more tweaking of the launch vehicle. Still, Mariner 4 was ready to launch in just three weeks, launching November 28, 1964. This time, the shroud separated properly, and the craft was successfully on its way. In a last effort to beat the Americans, the Soviets launched the Zond-2 spacecraft just two days later, headed for Mars on an almost identical mission, including a camera. But the spacecraft lost attitude control during a mid-course correction and had lost communication. Meanwhile, the UPI reported Mariner 4 was setting records. As long as its radio keeps working, they wrote, Every mile the Mariner 4 adds to its voyage through space, it sets a record for cosmic communications. The record it was breaking had been set by Mariner 2. 
While Mariner 4 did encounter problems, notably dust particles were occasionally reflecting light and confusing a navigation sensor that required lock on the star Canopus used as a navigational point, engineers were able to correct the problem, and just over seven months later, Mariner 4 approached Mars. Planetary data started to be returned on July 14th. Newspapers across America reported breathlessly. Since the 19th century, telescope observations of Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli spied what he called canali, mistranslated in English as canals, there had been speculation of life on Mars. Mariner 4 would test that. The Honolulu Star Tribune wrote, After 228 days in flight, Mariner 4 will pass behind Mars next Wednesday. Then comes the great moment. Will the camera work? Will the pictures get back okay? Will they answer the riddle of life on Mars? But getting those answers would take time. The camera would not start operating until the probe got closer, and then the data had to be transmitted. The UPI reported, for 12 hours, 33 minutes, starting late today, United States scientists will taste the agony of waiting for a $5 million picture without knowing if the camera even worked. It was not just a matter of the camera and the transmission. The photos included too much data to stream directly. Rather, they recorded on magnetic tape that would then be broadcast to NASA over time. The UPI continues, whether the agony is sweet or bitter will depend upon what is on or not on a spool of recording tape floating in space 134 million miles from Earth. And there was reason to worry. The tape recorder used was not originally intended to be used. It was a spare pressed into service after the failure of Mariner 3. And some anonymous readings had suggested a possible problem with the tape. If the recorder failed or sent some of the millions of bits of data incorrectly, much of the purpose of the mission would have been lost. This led to one of the most peculiar incidents in the history of space exploration. JPL's Dan Goods writes, After the failure of Mariner 3, NASA scientists and engineers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory anxiously awaited the signals from Mariner 4's cameras during the final approach to Mars. There had been some anonymous errors pointing towards the tape recorder, and they had a right to be nervous as the tape recorder on Mariner 4 was a spare, not originally intended for use. So Dick Grum, who oversaw the tape recorder, and his crew decided to prove that it was working, one way or the other. The issue was that even after transmission, it would take the NASA computers hours to process the image. Thus, Goods writes, while they were waiting, the engineers thought of different ways of taking the ones and zeros from the actual data and create an image. They decided that they could print out the digits of the raw data and manually color them based on how bright each pixel was. It was, in essence, a color by number that would demonstrate whether the data represented a picture or just a mess of useless data. But that required colors. Goods continues. So Mr. Grum went to a local art store and asked for a set of chalk with different shades of gray. The art store replied that they didn't sell chalk, but they did have colored pastels. Mr. did not want to spend a lot of time arguing with them, so he bought the pastels. While it was an example of engineering ingenuity, it caused NASA's people some concern, Goods explains. The JPLPR folks were getting nervous that the news media would see the thing and not the actual pretty images. They told them to quit, but Grum argued that this was being done to confirm whether the instrument was working or not. So they allowed him continue if he did it behind a movable partition wall with armed guards around them. But armed guards were not enough. Eventually the media found out about it, and it got so excited the PR people couldn't keep them out. So it became the first close-up image of Mars to be seen on TV. That is, the first picture of another planet to be successfully transmitted from deep space was hand-colored. Today it hangs, Goods writes, in an out-of-the-way place at JPL. The picture was representative of a mission that was an unqualified success. History professor Asif Siddiqui wrote in a 2018 NASA publication, Beyond Earth, The Chronicle of Deep Space Exploration, that the Mariner 4 mission was one of the great early successes of the agency, and indeed, of the space age. Mariner 4's photos revealed a planet full of craters, ending the century-old speculation about previous civilizations on Mars. It determined that the planet's surface pressure was low, critical information for future landings on the planet. The images, Siddiqui concludes, fundamentally transformed the scientific view of the red planet, providing hard data where speculation had previously dominated. The success of Mariner 4 would set the stage for the rest of the expansive program, which returned to Mars and Venus, as well as to Mercury. The Mariner 4 mission occurred in the midst of the space race, among many missions by both the United States and Soviet Union, and yet it set itself apart in proving the capabilities of deep space exploration, a point underscored when the probe, originally intended to have a life of eight months, continued sending data for three years 
providing critical insight into solar wind and micrometeorites. Because of Mariner 4, we know much more about our planetary neighbor, and our ability to successfully explore space was vastly improved. In the first pictures of another planet to be successfully sent from deep space represented a quantum leap in the human ability to extend our reach, and reach for the stars. And those pictures have special meaning to me, as they were taken as Mariner 4 made its closest approach to Mars on July 15th, 1965, which just happened to be my first birthday. History that deserves to be remembered. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you have to do is subscribe.